So we are going to continue with this theme around loving yourself and being able to show up and act in love for your community. Joining us next is Dr. John Paul Higgins, they, them, who is a social justice leader, media critic, educator, national speaker, freelance journalist, and thought leader who focuses on examining the intersections of identity, gender, and race in entertainment and education. Dr. Higgins is a trailblazer who is sharing the stories their ancestors did not get to tell. Dr. John Paul has continued to develop and create inclusion projects with industry leaders such as Fox, Disney, Apple, Instagram, and most recently worked with GLAAD on their 2021 HIV stigma report. They have also been a featured speaker for TEDx and completed, competed on the latest season of Netflix's hit show, Nailed It. They hold a doctorate in educational justice and often write and lecture about what liberation means for black, queer, non-binary people and how we can help them not just survive, but thrive. Dr. John Paul joins us today to share on social justice and self-care. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Paul. All right. Um, I just want to say I am officially a Kayla Stan. I will be selling her CDs at the end of this presentation in the back. All right, uh, thank you everybody for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I do wanna share that my pronouns are officially they, them, tired. And part of my pronouns being they, them, tired um, is making space to really help people think through their own tiredness and how they can continue to keep doing the work even when they feel like the work is hard. And so today, the presentation that I am going to be giving is a conversation about making self-care intentional. So some of my starting thoughts in this presentation is, is I want to acknowledge the ancestors. I recognize that I cannot stand here. I actually had a moment this morning when I woke up. Actually, when I had the black car come get me from the airport, I was like, oh, God made it. Um, <laughs> I was like, this is what Bayard Rustin fought for. Um, but I have to acknowledge the ancestors uh, to let them know that I am doing this work because of them and that I can't continue to show up as my authentic self without them and the work that they've put forward. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next thing is I really want to make sure that we make this uh, conversation about not bonding and trauma. I think it's really easy, especially as a black, queer, non-binary body for me to get up here and say, everything is terrible, right? But I think that there's so much more beauty in being able to say, I am standing here alongside you and community, and I'm going to give you some tools and some thoughtful questions that you can take with you to continue to do the work you need to do. Now, um, a big part of my work is I get this all the time, John, you are so relentless. And I tell people, or um, I, I get a lot of resiliency conversations around me. And I tell people, don't call me resilient, call me relentless. I, I, I think the big part of my life has been in every single space that I have been in, I've created a space for me. I've created a space for other folks who look and live like me, and I'm going to continue to do that. And a part of that is you all showing up in fearlessness today, okay? So I wanna make sure that I note that you all are fearless for being here, because it's so easy for us to kind of turn a blind eye to all the stuff that's happening around us and to say, hey, that's not my bag. I don't have to deal with that. The other thing is, is that I do want to call to the carpet that I do a lot of racial conversations I acknowledge that there's whiteness and white supremacy that's already in this room. And so the reality is, is for folks who have privilege in this room, regardless of how your privilege shows up, you have a responsibility to do better, okay? Maya Angelou tells us when we know better, we do better. And that is what I'm hoping that we all do today, is that when we leave here, we do a little bit better. So next. Um, one of the things that I always like to kind of bring up to the forefront is who are these ancestors that I talk about? Who are these um, ancestors that I'm positing in all of the work that I'm doing? And so I always like to throw out pictures of them in color because I think oftentimes we don't see them in color enough. We don't get to see the joy that lived in their faces, in their skin, and their glow, and their hue. So we have Marsha here, 
who taught me that if people get in my way to throw something at them and tell them to move. <laughs> I have Bayard Ruskin who laid out the blueprint for me, who told me this is how you do the work. I have Sylvia Rivera who told me to show up and scream in the moments where I felt like my voice was not being heard. And I have James Baldwin who told me to continue to keep writing. He is the reason why I am currently shopping a book as we speak. <laughs> so with that, I do like to say these are my ancestors. These are the people that I owe a lot of work to. So wanting to kind of get through this notion of how do we reframe the conversation around self-care? Yes, going to a spa. Yes, going to Lush. Doing all of the stuff that we love to do with capitalism, right, is important. But I think there's a conversation around balance that we're not having, a, that we're not talking enough about, right? This notion of how do we continue to find balance in our own lives in a world that was never built for us? This world was never built with a person like me in mind, right? How do we jumpstart the intentional self-care? I always like to tell people that no is a full sentence. <laughs> And I don't owe anyone an explanation when I say no, right? So I think that's important for us to note today is that we have to be intentional with our own self-care and that no. Audre Lorde laid the foundation for us. She says, when caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it's self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. So when you tell someone that you do not have the capacity that you are not in a place that you have enough emotional space to give. That is that political warfare. And for my black, brown, non-binary, trans, queer people that are in this room, we are expected to do a lot with a little. And so the reality becomes, how do we continue to protect ourselves in this work when we're being asked to do more than what resources we are being given to do? So how do we reframe this conversation? First, I want to make sure that I note that it is important for us to be okay with self-care being an act of indulgence. Somewhere in your life, someone told you, work hard. The play hard, yeah, that kind of falls away, right? But this notion for me of self-care being an act of indulgence is telling myself that when I'm laying on my couch and I'm watching TV, or I'm shooting out tweets, or I'm engaging with other people around the work that I'm doing, that it is okay for me to be in that moment. Rest is a part of self-care and self-indulgence. I want to acknowledge that. We want to remind ourselves that self-care is in fact a discipline. I like to tell myself often that I know what hard work looks like because I'm here in front of you today. But the reality is, is that I can't keep doing this work if I am not full if I am not pouring into my own cup, if I'm not telling people I have boundaries, sometimes my mom will call me and I'm like, not today, mom, love you, but I gotta call you back tomorrow. Sometimes my brother will call me and I'm like, not, to not today, Bubba, gotta call you back tomorrow, right? This notion of me being very intentional about how I make that a discipline for myself. The thing that I really wanna note is that there are facets to self-care that we don't talk enough about, right? And one of these facets is being able to have a better body. I will say because of capitalism, I am thankful that I can afford a Peloton. But if you follow me and you know I ride every single day and people are always like, are you riding to lose weight? And I'm like, no, I'm riding because I ultimately just want to feel good in this big body. And it is okay for those of you who are big in here to feel good in your big body, okay? I always like to tell people I've been thinner and I was sad and I've been sad at big too, so what's the point? I'm gonna eat the taco. Okay, y'all are just gonna get the big body. It's for the better mind. This is a lot of therapy standing in front of you. Shout out to my therapist, Lindsay. But ultimately too, I can stand in front of you and not be nervous because I'm standing in my full self. And that's a part of self-care, right? Where I'm thinking about every single day, I'm saying, John, how do you wanna show up? I want to show up as my best, my best self. And so that's me constantly thinking through how I feel, how I intentionally put out vibes into spaces. People come up to me all the time, John, you have a good vibe. I'm like, yep, and I'm protecting it. <laughs> right? That's me making sure that I think about how I feel about myself. I often share this idea too. Have you ever been in a space where you've been doing your work 
and you'll be doing something and you hear, oh my gosh, nobody will ever care for it. Nobody ever love, will ever love it the way you love it. That's you getting out of your own head and saying, I want to make my mind better. So the thoughts that you have about yourself, the way you feel about yourself, the way you talk about yourself. I walk past the mirror all the time and go, you cute, all right. That's what I want folks to do in order to uh, build up that self-care. And then a better soul for yourself. There are a lot of ugly souls in this world. A lot of ugly souls. And I always like to tell people that a part of doing your self-care work and being intentional about that is ducking and dodging those ugly souls. I have a lot of friends that I have cut off. People say, you can't cut off family. Yes, I can. Edward Scissorhands, I will cut you off in a second. That is a part of my self-care, okay? So I want to make sure that I'm giving that to you all as well. Self-care is not a luxury. This is something that I think we see promoted on TikTok. We see it promoted on Instagram. We see the white people frolicking in the, in the fields. This is self-care, right? But it's not a luxury. This is an idea that you have to do in order to take care of your overall self. And so I want to break into what this overall self is, because I think that we talk enough about self-care, but we don't ever really posit what the self-care is when we talk about the overall self. So let's get into that work. It's the physical self-care first. How do you fuel your body? This body is fueled by Starbucks, no shade. <laughs> but at the same time, it's also fueled by putting in positive words, by making sure that when I walk into spaces that I can feel like I can be my authentic self and say what needs to be said. Are you getting adequate sleep? I know a lot of us like to kind of, oh, I only got four hours of sleep, but I'm still doing it. No, I tell people I need 7.5. You will not get a good Dr. John if I don't have at least 7.5 hours of sleep. And even when I don't feel like I can get it, I still fight for it. My husband, why are you still laying in bed? Because I still have an extra hour for myself. That is the reason, that is something that I want us thinking about. Are we taking charge of our health and holding our doctors accountable? That is something that I don't think we talk enough about. When I walk into a doctor's office, they'll say, you need to lose more weight. And I'll say, that's not what I'm here for. If I wanted information on losing weight, I'd follow someone on Instagram. <laughs> I didn't come here for that. My eye is twitching and my body is tired. Figure it out. I just paid $25 for the copay. <laughs> no, real, real talk. These doctors will play you, okay, when it comes to your physical health. Black people, hold them accountable. Document stuff. Oh, you didn't want to do that? Document it. We'll come back to it. That is important for your physical self. Are you listening to what your body might be telling you? Your body is going to tell you over and over again, I don't like these people at this job. This job is not good for me. The thing that I am doing is not good for me. This marriage is not good for me. This friendship is not good for me. It makes me feel the way when I'm around these people. Listen to that. That's what the ancestors are telling us. They are telling you to take care of you. That's the physical self part. Now let's get into this social self-care conversation. It's about cultivating relationships that are intentional. Cultivating relationships that are intentional. If you feel like someone is constantly calling you and asking you for help and you don't feel the same way, that's not a friendship. That's not social self-care. What did I just say? So, cut them off. Say it, say it louder, cut them off. You got to learn to cut them off. Are you getting enough distance face-to-face -face time with your friends? I keep my six feet, but I love to see you. I wear my mask. I'm vaccinated. Twice. What are you doing to nurture your relationships with your friends and family? I always like to tell people, having a friendship with me means honesty. You do something I don't like, I'm going to tell you. I want you to do the same thing for me. Because when I'm around you, I want to feel like this is not only safe, but a brave space for me. And not enough of us are nurturing brave and safe spaces in the relationships that we have, both with families, friends, coworkers, et cetera. When people call me in to do work, I always like to tell them, I'm gonna be black and queer first. <laughs> but also a big part of me is being honest. 
And if you don't want to be honest, I'm not the person for you. I would like to tell people to drink, drink, drink some water. You probably need it anyway. I may not be a cup of tea, but drink some water. Okay, you'll be all right. Have your limited interactions with people who don't make you feel good about you. There are a lot of people that are in our lives that have made us feel terrible about who we are. A lot of them are people you go home to day in and day out. No shade. I have limited interactions with those people. I'm going to just be blunt. My father is one of them. My cousins are, are, are some of them. Old friends from college who think we're still good Judies. Nah, I've done the work. Something about you don't make me feel good. Limited social interactions. Mute people on social media. Mute words on social media that don't make you feel good. Diet is a word that I have muted. <laughs> okay? Just want to make sure that I note that. <laughs> Mental self-care, the way you think about the things, that you, or the way you feel about yourself, this greatly influences the way that you feel about yourself, right? So asking yourself, are you aware of how you talk to yourself about yourself? A lot, I always like to tell people, when was the first time that you were made to feel terrible about you? I know that moment. And a big part of it is me clocking it before it gets into my mind and starts to shape the way I feel about me. A lot of this is work. And I know some of you are probably sitting, what is that? This is work. And a big part of self-care is having hard conversations about the way you think and you feel about yourself. But also, too, about the interactions that you have with other people in regards to this mental space that you're in. Are you practicing self-compassion? This is something that I don't think we talk enough about. I always like to tell people, you are doing the best that you can with what you have, and that's okay. That is self-compassion. And a big part of the work that we have to continue to do is to give ourselves self-compassion, because if you are not well, then the work is not well. We can't be here. Self-empathy. What does self-empathy look like for you? Do you like you? Because I love me, and I want you all to love you too. There's work that comes with that. Are you giving yourself the love that you so freely give to everybody else? I want us to sit with that. Because I always like to say, I see people and I watch people. I talk a lot, but I also watch a lot too. And I'll see people throw out compliments to other people. I love your shoes. I love your hair. I love what you have on over there. And then when you get a compliment, you're like, oh, ooh, ah, that feels weird. I don't feel good in that compliment. People will say, Dr. Higgins, I love that article you wrote. Thanks. I appreciate it, because I know I'm a bad one, right? <laughs> I am giving myself the love that I am so happy to give everyone else. That is a part of my mental self-care. It makes me feel good to know people love on me, and I love on other people. Let's talk about this spiritual self-care, because I think a lot of us will talk about it from a religious standpoint, and as someone, if you've watched my TEDx or if you watched or you follow a lot of the stuff I do, I talk a lot about religion. And I will say that I'm not going to say that religion is bad, but there are a lot of bad things that we pick up from religion that impacts our self-care, right? And so a big part of it is having a relationship with your spiritual, um, your spiritual self, right? This does not need to involve a religion. If you're Christian, hey, go up. If you celebrate, if you celebrate from the house of Beyonce like me, Come on over. I welcome you. <laughs> but a big part of it, right, is developing a deeper sense of meaning. And I don't know if many of us have conversations about, what have I been called to do in this life? How do I make people feel when I'm around them? How do I feel about myself when I'm around other people? People will always say, John, you are a light. I know this because I've been called to be a light in other people's lives. So I want you all to sit with that. What is your higher sense of self? What questions are you asking about your life experience? I know Oprah, I don't know if you've seen that clip from Oprah, but Oprah had said um, years ago, she wakes up every morning and she says, I don't know what my calling is, but use me. That is how I wake up every morning now. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what this journey is. I can't drive a stick, but I'm gonna get there, <laughs> okay, right? I want us thinking about where are we going and what is that experience that we're having. Are we engaged in spiritual practices that are fulfilling? For me, a spiritual practice is riding my Peloton. 
going for a run, taking a walk with my partner. These are all things that help me feel better about the life that I have. Sometimes listening to a song that makes me feel something, right? And connecting with that song and saying, huh, what's the deeper meaning in that? You won't break my soul, I've been listening to it all week. People may try to crack it, <laughs> but you ain't gonna break it, right? What makes you feel whole? That is the thing that I don't think we talk enough about when we're talking about self-care. What makes you feel like a whole person? For me, what makes me feel like a whole person is standing here, is being able to engage other people around the things that people didn't give me when I was 15 and 16 and felt like I didn't have a purpose in this life. This makes me feel whole. I want you all to kind of find that in your life too. So this emotional self-care, right? This allows us to have conversations about how we process the things that we're feeling because I want, I, the person who was singing here, Kayla, they were talking about that human connection. What are you processing as a human connection? A human experience that you're having. A lot of the stuff that I see and a lot of the conversations I have with people, they make me feel a way. But I always like to tell people, you know, John, why are you always so angry? I am human. I have a right to respond because my emotions are responding. This is how I feel. I always lead conversations, especially if I'm uncomfortable, I always leave it. This is how I feel, and you ain't going to change it. That is a part of my self-care. Do you have healthy ways to process your emotions? A healthy way for me is kind of dashing through Krispy Kreme. Mm -hmm. It may not be the healthiest for some other people, but sometimes it's healthy for me. But there are other healthy ways that I have conversations. I see a therapist. I talk to my mom. Me and my mom are very close. And I tell her everything that's going on around me, right? That is a part of how I process the way I see the world. Are you giving yourself agency to recharge? This is something that my therapist gave me. She said, um, I remember one time I was having a conversation with her, and she stopped me in mid conversation, and she said, you are so, you're always on. You always come in these conversations with your boxing gloves on. When do you ever take them off? And I just was like, pew. $50 well spent, <laughs> right? I needed a moment to recharge. And that's what a lot of the conversations I had did for, for me. What is that thing that makes you happy to be alive? I think for me, what makes me happy to be alive is when people stop me and say, hey, I saw that tweet or I saw this something that you did. Thank you. I had a woman stop me. I was at a conference and a woman stopped me and said that her son, who was trans non-binary, they were transitioning, was very happy that they were able to see someone like myself. That gave me purpose. I said, I see what you're doing, God. <laughs> Self-care is not selfish. That is something I want you all to get out of today because we are made to feel safe, selfish when we say, I don't have the energy to go into work today, I don't have the energy to have this conversation. When people text you, I, or I text my friends and I say, do you have the capacity to have this conversation? I'm, I'm very intentional about that. I want you all to be very intentional about your thoughts as well around that. You cannot serve from an empty vessel. A lot of us are running on E, period. And you have every right to. But the reality is, is what are you doing to fill that vessel back? So some reminders that I want to give folks before we take some questions. You are doing the best you can with what you have. You are worthy of self-love and self-care. Your boundaries are important. I am huge on boundaries now, especially since I feel like my world is starting to expand a little bit. People think they know me because they follow me. No, girl. <laughs> you don't know me. That's a boundary that I like to keep. Your feelings are valid. People love to gaslight. We live in a world full of gaslighting. And if I feel a way and someone says, that's not how you feel, no, nah, girl, we're not going to play that game today. I own the way that I feel. But lastly, it is OK to heal. And I'm not saying I don't have work to do or continued work to do, but what you see in front of you today is someone who is doing the work to heal. And that is what I want for everybody in this room today, outside of self-care. Your self-care is that meaningful moment to heal. So with that being said, I just simply, I, I genuinely wanted to take this moment. I, I know the clock is running and we still have questions and things out there. I genuinely want to say, I do not take this for granted. I don't take this work for granted. I don't take for granted that you all are here today listening to my big body and big hair talk. 
but I appreciate you and the work that you are doing because there are so many people who are looking up to you as well as myself. And so with that, i just like to say thank you to everybody who put this together. Thank you for everyone for listening. Um, and I am really excited to take questions or thoughts or anything that you all have. Um, but I hope that this resonates with you as this whole entire experience resonated for me. So thank you. Questions, thoughts? Don't throw a tomato. Me. Please. Go ahead. It's not a question. It's just going to say thank you so much for reinforcing that I am in the right place. Oh, thank you. Thank you. My priority oh. is always take care of others. Mm -hmm. They call me Mama Luz, <laughs> and I'm very honored to be here. Oh, thank you so much for reinforcing that to me. Yeah, thank you. I feel that. I feel that, thank you. I'm watching this clock run. <laughs> Hi, Hi. Um, so I'm a director of a shelter and I have staff who report to me and staff who report to them. And um, I really talk about self-care a lot. I try to encourage self-care, it's probably a, conversation that comes up with every meeting. How do you, how would you um, advise to meet people when the conversation gets stuck? You're like, how are you doing in your self-care? What can we do? How can you be intentional? And it's always like, I don't have time. Or like you feel like you're not able to influence self-care and you're watching the consequences of that. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think what, so what I hear you asking is, how do you enforce, <laughs> and I hate that word, but enforce or how do you push someone to take care of themselves in work that can be heavy? I think saying it just like that is, is, is a big start, right? Helping them understand that the work that they are doing is heavy. The work that they are doing is essential. And if they are not well in doing that work, thank you, um, it's not going to help them get across or get done what they need to get done. Um, I think it was, it's important, so, I, name drop. Um, Francesca Ramsey is a good friend of mine. And I remember when I first started doing this and I was traveling and I was speaking and I was doing all of this work, um, I was like, I, I gotta get this work done, I gotta get, and she pulled me to the side or she called me and she said, you know what? You need to slow down because if you are not well, this work is not gonna get done. And it took me a moment to understand what she was doing. It was in, an intentional moment from two friends that were saying, I understand the work needs to get done, but if you are not in the work, then who's gonna do it? So I think it's important for folks to understand that, I'm gonna say it this way, I think it's important for us to understand the ways that white supremacy works, and that's a big part of it, right? If I can keep you busy and keep you going and tire you out, the system lives. So you need to help these people understand what the system is. I think that's your, and again, I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, because I'm not you now, but I'm telling you, right, it's important to help folks understand how these systems are working. And I think that's going to be essential in helping uh, your folks grow. Um, I'd love to hear some advice for parents who are trying to engage in self-care and parents of multiple children, single child. It's just a stressful environment in general, but wondering how you would approach parents in that space. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I, so my mom was a single parent. She raised me and my brother. Um, and I can recall moments as a kid when I remember my mom <laughs> and going in her room and like trying to hide from us um, or eating a candy bar and be like, it's just for me and me not understanding that as a seven, eight year old kid. Um, I think boundaries are gonna be the, the biggest conversation, right? And having real conversation. I don't know if any of you follow uh, the Supernova Mom, but the work that she's doing around parenting and creating boundaries and having real conversations with your kids even me, I don't want children, but I'm learning a lot from following her. Um, about boundaries even with my nephew, right? My nephew comes over, he likes, you know, Uncle John, can I have your phone? No, because I, I have to go to a meeting. John, can I play it? No. Helping him understand what it is, right? What these boundaries look like. Um, my nephew is five, but he gets it. 
and I think we talk to kids like they don't, having real conversations with them about what it means to feel well. If you want mommy to be well in this moment, you'll give me five minutes, because <laughs> if I'm not good, then you're not good, right? So I think having those conversations, I see my brother and my sister-in-law do it all the time, um, and that's the advice that I have. Follow the parents and the people on the socials who are doing the work about um, intentional parenting, and I think that's the word that I'm hearing. So, two minutes. One more question, and then um, I'll scurry away. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Um, Clementine, a teacher at, uh, as a preschool teacher. I want to thank you. Thank you. For reminding me that self-care is not selfish. Mm -hmm. And thank you for enforcing me um, give me courage of listening to my mind more than listening to people or think about what will people say, what will, how does it look like? Mm -hmm. So I feel like listening more to my mind than listening to people. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm gonna say this real quick, yes. A big thing on courage, so a big part of me, you know, I get asked this question all the time. Dr. Higgins, how do you show up as your authentic self all the time, even when you're afraid? Audrey Lord and Zeal Neal Hurston said this, that even when you don't speak, you're afraid, so you might as well speak. I always like to say I speak truth to power because I recognize that I don't have the luxury to be afraid. I don't have the luxury to be scared. I don't have the luxury. Um, I walk out every day. I'm everything that the world hates. And so I have to show up and say, this is who I am and all that I am. And I'm encouraging everybody to do that. Because again, if you are not well, you ain't going to be well. With that being said, I got to go. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Jean-Paul. All right, I need to say a couple of things to you, though. All right, now, I wish I would try to say to my mother, not today, mama. Mm-mm. <laughs> Self-preservation is like top of my to-do list, and that would be jeopardizing that, so that is not, that is not gonna work for me. And before we moved out here, we lived in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which is the headquarters of Krispy Kreme. And my two doors neighbor down was the corporate nutritionist for Krispy Kreme. I know, right? I was like, what the hell do you do? I could do that job. Like, oh no, needs more sugar. Add more lard, not enough calories. I was like, what does a corporate nutritionist for Krispy Kreme do? That, that had to be a sweet gig. That's, that's all I know. So thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Jean Paul has a birthday this week. Anybody else with a birthday between now and Friday? All right. So we're going to sing happy birthday all y'all. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear friends. Happy birthday to you. And then I, th I think Kayla had to leave, but I wanted to say, listening to her reminded me about 10, 12 years back when they, this, this trend started where if you were speaking somewhere, they'd ask you, like, what's your favorite song or what song do you want to be? introduced to. And so I remember 10 or 12 years ago when the first time that happened with me, I asked my family. So my daughter, who was at the time probably 12 and was really getting into country music, said, oh, mommy should have them play Shania Twain's I Feel Like a Woman. I was like, oh, that's a good one. And then my son, who was probably nine at the time, and was then and still is into the crooners. He loves Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby and Nat King Cole and that crowd. He says, oh, mommy, you should have him play Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way. I was like, oh, OK. So then my husband says, well, you didn't ask me. And I was like, right. <laughs> he said, well, I have the perfect one. He said, they should play Elton John's The Bitch Is Back.
and I said, I hope you and your next wife will be very <laughs> happy, happy together. <laughs>